Hi folks, this is Ryan from RNA Music and here with a special treat. We're doing an artist spotlight today. And today at the shop we have Jimmy Bailey and Paul DeJaro of Jimmy Bailey and the Aristocrats. So uh, I've known these guys for a little bit of time and I want to just kind of pick their brains about what they do and their music they write. And so we're going to do a little interview here. So um, let's get rolling. All right, so this is for Jimmy. Most of these questions are going to be for Jimmy, but I may... Uh, get a few in here for Paul, but, um, well, first off, when did you start playing guitar? Uh, I started, like, I didn't really pick it up until, like, right after high school, because I was, I did a lot of sports and stuff, and then once all that was over, I was like, what else am I going to do with my spare time, so I, I had a, a, an old guitar of my mom's and a, a 33 record of Surf Songs guitar instructional record, Riff. and a red and white, uh, Mickey Mouse guitar player, and that's how I started learning how to play guitar. That's pretty So you were like 18, 19? Yeah, yeah. 18, 19 with the Mickey Mouse record? Player. Yeah, it was awesome. Sweet! <laughs> that's great! <laughs> cool. Uh, Alright, so um, you started learning then. What, what was the first song you learned, do you think, all the way through? Um, probably Social Distortion's Bad Luck was probably the first one. Three easy chords, you know. Well, we love three chords. Yeah. Cool, awesome. What kind of what kind of guitar did you start with? Um, the 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 acoustic that I had wasn't really working. It was a really cheap guitar. So uh, a friend of mine, a friend of yours, uh, I bought John Mann's old Area Pro guitar. Oh, John Mann. Yeah, and uh, I kept kept that guitar for a long time, and but really taught myself how to play on it. It was years before I actually had an acoustic guitar for that was worth anything. So that your first one was that. So what was uh what was the next guitar you got that really? Um, I think it was a Ovation, just an acoustic that I had. I've, I've had so many over the, over the years, you know. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Great. Cool. Uh, I'm referring to my notes here because I can't remember everything, so. Um, okay. Great. Well, uh, who, who were some of your earlier influences when it comes to either playing guitar or um, just... Because you really, you really you write a lot of songs, I'd say a songwriter maybe primarily, but right. guitar playing or songwriting, who were your earliest guys you looked up to? Um, yeah, the bands that I would, that really made me want to play guitar were Social Distortion, uh, Fleetwood Mac. I've always been a big Lindsey Buckingham fan, mm -hmm. just the stuff that he did. Uh, Concrete Blonde, uh, Guns N' Roses, you know. Just yes. The, like, I can remember the first CDs I ever bought, and those are all CDs from those guys, and they're all just because I really wanted to find out more about, I was really getting into guitar, mm -hmm. and, and they were doing some things that I thought were different. Cool. So not the typical, see, I expected you to say, like, Willie Nelson, or, no, no, you know, or something no. like that. Well, see, I grew up in, like, I grew up in a bar, basically, and mm -hmm. so I always had the jukebox songs, mm -hmm. you know, those were, those were just a part of life. You know, and it was these other bands that made me realize it wasn't all like that and got me really interested in it. I still love those other songs, but those weren't what made me want to do it. Right. Okay, cool. Um, who's, uh, that's that's kind of who you started with, that, that sort of inspired you to start playing. What, what about right now? Are there any kind of current, um, newer artists, maybe independent people that really kind of, when you hear their music, you really dig it or it inspires you to go write a song or something? Yeah, right now I'm... Uh, I'm really into the drive by truckers. Um, I love what they do, but I don't hardly listen to the radio that much anymore. The guys that influence me are the guys that I've been playing in clubs with around here for a long time, like uh, the Whiskey Fish guys, you know, mm -hmm. Matt J.P. Fisher, Wesley Pruitt, David Harness, Jason Heron. Uh, those, they're all guys that, Boyce Edwards Band, they're all guys that I've known forever, and I just have so much respect for the, the songs that they write. And, and they keep me going more than anything. So mostly a lot of sort of the local Texas music scene yeah. guys. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. I, I you know I I moved to Oklahoma for a couple of years and I was up there and uh, in Tulsa and there was a you know the whole red dirt kind of scene going and those guys all seem pretty tight. Is, is it a different deal like with with Texas guys and Texas musicians or? I think it's similar. Um, I know that when the red dirt thing was was really starting to make some noise. I mean, that was kind of right whenever we were all going around doing the open mics and the, mm -hmm. the singer-songwriter competitions, and we were always running into each other. I think it influenced everybody that, that 
I'm talking about right now at, at that time. I mean, it, it, it changed a lot for everybody. Yeah. You know, that more rocky, uh, the, 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 what it was about was, you know, you had, you had Nashville that was, you know, the starched, the starched shirts and uh -huh. cowboy hats and the fade out, you know, and that yeah. kind of thing. And, and the, the Texas slash red dirt scene was more about wear your t-shirt and you can still, you know, put on a good show and tell a good story. You know, you don't have to have all the... You don't have to have a 10-gallon hat. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to have the, the drama with you, you know. But that's <laughs> cool. So, all right. Well, uh, let's see where we're at. Ah, okay. So that's a little bit about the local kind of guys around here. And um, Now, tell me a little bit about the current lineup, Jimmy Bailey and the Aristocrats. Right. We have an aristocrat yeah, here well, today. Yeah. How, did, how did your uh, your band kind of come up together? <laughs> um, they're, they're just guys like I went to high school with Paul um, well his sister he was a little bit younger but uh, <laughs> we're professionals <laughs> yeah take two it happens <laughs> let me turn that off we can edit that right yeah <laughs> or not mm. edit scene take two okay radio edit edit Sorry about that. Cool. <laughs> so we were talking about uh, you know the current lineup of your your band. You do a lot of solo acoustic stuff, but you also have a band that you play with. So um, the Aristocrats, and we have this guy here. Paul so how did, how did your uh, how did your current band kind of all come together? Um. Well, I I met Paul. Really, we started playing together through Charles. I guess our drummer Charles Sharp. And uh, I was looking for a bass player, and he's like, hey, I know a guy. And then I was like, okay, so I meet this guy. So then I meet Paul, and I realized I knew Paul mm -hmm. from a long time ago. And uh, and it's pretty much us. Uh, we don't have a lead guitar player right now, really. Um, some friends of mine will come in and sit in every once in a while, but it's pretty much just the three of us. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, Paul. Green Day did it. We can, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, all right, so you play bass. Where, how did you get started uh, playing bass? Where, where, where did your musical journey begin? Oh, wow, you couldn't ask a more boring question. <laughs> uh, I grew up in I Richardson. I probably could. No, I grew up in Richardson, and in Richardson, the band out there, you had band and you had orchestra. And then the year before I was going to start playing in a band, I wanted to play in an orchestra, and I wanted to play a cello. And then my mom moved me to the wonderful town of Canton, which they had which is a band great. and no string instruments whatsoever. So I played baritone for like, I don't know. I played it for seven years, but about five years into music, I asked the band director, I was like, hey, if I bought a cello, would you let me play it in a band? And he laughed at me. He was like, no. He's like, there's no string instruments in a band, not unless you play bass, you know? There's basses, that, uh, string basses in bands. So he's like, if you buy one of those, I'll let you play it in here. I guess I didn't think I'd buy one, so I went and I bought one and uh, played one ever since 1992. Uh, Self-taught and played ever since. Wow, awesome! So, so as a bass player who uh, not not the big upright, but like cello, you have a bass. Who are your uh, biggest influences? Oh, uh, you know. Sade, real laid back kind of stuff. Oh, nice. No, it's uh, <laughs> smooth jazz. <laughs> smooth jazz. Uh, Yanni's bass player. No. <laughs> now, I like the lead bass kind of stuff. I like, of course, Operation Ivy, Green Day, Rancid. Uh, anything that actually has a lead bass to it. The bass isn't as boring as what most people think. So it's easy to play. It's hard to master, that kind of thing. So a little more of a logic, but I don't know too bad. A little I'm a master baser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So with a little more of the melodic bass playing. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like the John Paul Jones. John Paul Jones. Yeah, Led Zeppelin definitely. Um, it all started out like I said. I played a lot of big band jazz until one day a friend of mine brought me back, showed me a cassette, the cassette tape, put it in, and because you got to hear this bass line. And it was Green Days when I come around, and I was like, oh, a, a bass playing lead on something. I was like, finally. So after that, I wasn't just the looks of the band. I actually had talent. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Excellent. Well, you know, looks and talent together are important. So yes. It's good you could bridge those two things there. 
All right, let's see. Um, all right, now, Jimmy, now I know you you write a lot of songs. Uh, how many songs would you say you've written in toto uh, up to this point? A couple hundred, I'm sure. I mean, I, I've got so many partial songs, it's ridiculous. You know, I almost write something daily. Wow. But, you know, actually finishing songs, you know, it's, it's up where it around a couple hundred at least. A couple hundred finished? Yeah. And then some more bits yeah, and pieces? Yeah, all kinds of bits and pieces, yeah. Wow. Do you keep track of them? Do you record them? Or do you... Yeah, I try to. Uh, I've got a little uh, Boss Tex 8-track uh, recorder that I keep handy at the house. Um, I have to. I mean, pretty much. If if I don't record a song, like, right as soon as I write it, I'll forget it. Wow. You know, and then what will what'll happen is I'll, I'll fill up the memory card over the course of months or even a year or whatever, and then once the memory card's full, then I go dump it all on my computer and go, oh, let's, let's cool. go see what we have here. <laughs> You know, do you go back and review that from time to time, or just yeah. to kind of, hey, oh, oh, I forgot about that? Well, you know, I'll, you'll write one, and you're like, man, I, I can't wait to play this one for people. Which I write, I think, a little different than some people do. Uh, like, some people will they'll write a song, or they'll start writing a song, and if they get bored with the song, and you know, while they're writing it, they'll they'll give up on it. But I, I always want try to make myself finish whatever it is I'm writing, mm -hmm. just even if in the middle of the song. I, think it stinks just because I mean it's the law of averages you know if I write 10 crappy songs then I'm bound to write one good one in there somewhere right yeah <laughs> cool. I remember uh, reading an article with uh, Jack Black he was talking about Tenacious D and their writing process I don't know if he's telling a joke or not because it's Jack Black you know but he'd say he'd sit down with like a tape recorder and a microphone and just play for like 10 hours and out of 10 hours you might get like one minute of awesome Mm -hmm. And they take that one minute of awesome and turn it into a song. So yeah, I could definitely see that working. So you got to kind of sift through some stuff to find that really that one nugget, maybe. Yeah, and and, and it's it's real it's real weird too that like I've got you know songs that are on my hard drive at home that I wrote ten years ago, and I thought they stunk, and then you go back and listen to them you know, years later, and you're like, maybe this song isn't that bad, you know? Maybe if I change a little bit here or there. Yeah. You know, maybe maybe this song has something to do with it, you know. <clears throat> I think there's a bug in our crickets. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well do you have a um you have a certain process that you kinda of follow when you write a song or is it different every time or you know, how do you develop that, that nugget into a, a full blown song? Um I think you have to have an idea, I mean really, that it usually centers around a neat a word. Like if, there, if I find a neat word that I want to see if I can write a song about this word or around this word, or somebody will say something clever, or I'll read something clever, and then you try to figure out, okay, now what story can I tell? Because you have to have a beginning and an ending, you know. And you, you try to try to come up with some kind of a complete thought, and then you try to make it clever around it, I guess. Cool. And I look at, or I'll hear songs, you know, and I'll. I'll when I when I hear a song, I try to go back and try to figure out why I like it, and uh, you know you look at the structure. Okay, well, well this this song structured weird. You know it's mm -hmm. verse verse chorus 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 verse chorus chorus. You know whatever. Well maybe I want to try to write a song like that. So and there's a lot of things that go on with it, but um, it, it varies. But it usually just starts with with a line or a word, and you just build around there. Cool. I know a lot of people. You know. Especially young young kids here at here, at R&B music I, I teach, you know, and I have a lot of beginner students that learn play guitar for the first time or learn play drums for the first time, and, and some of them like you know I've got some words. I have one student that's written all these songs. I'm like, oh great, you've written these songs. It's, well, I don't have any music. I'm like, oh, okay, well so you've written a lot of poetry, and it's not really. So let's put it to music. But everybody kind of always asks, well, what when you're writing a song, do you start with music? Do you start with the words? And, Everybody has a different opinion, but do, do you tend to start with words first, or is it? Yeah, because I'm not, um, I'm not a, I'm not a real good melody guy. I think there, there are really two different kinds of writers. Um, there's the real wordy kind of writers, and then there's the guys that are that are really really good with melodies. Like uh, Matt and J P Fisher are also with melodies. Jason Aaron's also with melodies. They they're really good at uh, finding a very simple way. Of saying something extraordinary, mm -hmm. and the other school, with well, so like maybe me and David Harness, um, we're a little bit more wordy, and uh, so we kind of try to lean on 
find an extraordinary way to say something simple, that kind of thing. So my, my songs usually just start out with just three basic chords and then try to find a, a neat rhythm or, or a pattern or something and then cool. you know, take it from there. Well, you have a bass player who we've already talked about who's kind of uh, not your typical thump, thump, thump bass player. He's right. melodically, is, how does that affect your music? Right? Oh, it's awesome. Uh, I, we can, I can sit up there and play a, a boring three chord song and it be and Paul's over there like a lead guitar player, you know what I mean? He's telling his own little story over there and that's that's very cool. I'm real grateful to have that available. <laughs> well, how do you... Uh, <laughs> tear! Awesome. Yeah, you, man. yeah good bass players are hard to find, I, I'm told. You know? but, uh, so when you're, Paul, when you're writing um, bass lines or you're playing... Um, with someone, and you basically got me three or four chords to work with. Do you have what goes through your mind when you're when you're trying to come up with the bass part? Do you actually uh, might sound weird, but I listen to the words to try to get the idea of what the story is first, and then I'll listen to the song on repeat for maybe an hour or two straight. People actually don't know that I do that, and I'll sit there and listen in that until something just forms in my head, and once it starts forming in my head, and I'll. It sounds better in my head until I can get it on bass because once I pick up the bass and start playing it doesn't sound right for some reason. That doesn't comprehend the sound for some reason. And then I try to explain the song to somebody and you've both been there. I'm sitting there, oh the drums do this, the bass does this, the guitar does this. And then you're like, <laughs> okay, I was like, in my head it's awesome, trust me. <laughs> so, um, no, it's just, it just takes a while to get the feeling out of what to do and knowing where to put stuff when the, the right place to put it. Yeah. I mean, so it all starts... In your brain. Oh yeah, is that? I wake up in the middle of the night singing something in my head and try to remember it the next morning. Uh, as far as words, I can't. Words. Words. Writing, <laughs> writing lyrics and stuff. Who needs them? <laughs> okay. So this sounds like a good match. You know, Jimmy seems like the lyrical guy, and you know, the melodies are there. Now you said that you were basically self-taught as a musician, but I happen to know that you did go through, you know band program at school and did you, you ever take some bass lessons somewhere? I actually didn't take bass lessons until my senior years and I went uh, I've been playing the electric bass. The transition from the upright to the electric was harder than I actually thought it would be and I started taking lessons my senior year in Dallas and uh, I only took that for about a year mm -hmm. and then I taught myself some more after that and tried to go to another guy who by that time anything they tried to teach me I already knew the only thing I had to readjust to was technique mm -hmm. and my technique still different according to what you're supposed to do it's still different from that but you have some working knowledge though of like scales oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff like that yeah that all started in high school all right so you have some practical knowledge of you know if we're in a certain key of a song and well you know these notes are generally going to fit and these notes are going to sound not as good doesn't mean they're wrong, they just don't sound quite as good. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> he's told me a couple times, he's like, I know that fits, but just don't put it there. I'm like, all right. And I'll, I'll go back and re-record, so, yeah, wow. yeah. Cool. Let me see where we're at now. Uh, yeah, yeah, we talked about advice for young kiddos trying to get out there. Um, no, we did. I meant to. Did I ask? Uh, what was, uh, if you have a young, like I have, like I said, a lot of young students that are learning to play, and some of them want to write songs. Do you have any advice for, you know, a young kid trying to, man, take those little baby steps into, I want to write my own song or, or whatever? Man, the hardest part is just actually doing it. I mean, you, you've got to. And, and ultimately, you, you control when and where somebody hears it. So you can write what you want. But write what you know. You know, mm -hmm. make sure it's true. And then and people will dig it. I mean, you know, you're always going to have some people won't, you know, but... Uh, it won't be their bag of tea or cup of tea, whatever the saying yeah. is. But just you, you write what you know, and uh, and and go all out on it. You know, I and mean, then just get in the practice of doing that. Um, your influences, study them. Um, I don't mean just like learn their songs. Um, look at how they write their songs. What is it about this artist that really gets you? And uh, and then you start looking at you start looking at songwriting differently. Mm -hmm. And and you start getting an idea, you start building confidence that you can actually do it. Um, so I mean, that's all I can just. The hardest part is getting started. Just believing that you can do it. Yeah, yeah. I, I've had a few um, students. I just kind of tell them, 
you know, I have a background going through school and studying music at the college level and all the theory stuff that Paul was talking about. And, you know, for me, I kind of think of it in terms of it's not really rocket science. If you're like, you know, if you got three chord, you know, these three chords are going to sound good together, then it's kind of coming up with a melody. And I, I think a lot of young kids they they think it's like this terrible mystery that like <laughs> I'll never be able to do it. And it's like, well, no, just give it a shot. You know, it just here, play these four chords in whatever order you want, and then uh, you know try to sing something over it and see if you get a little nugget. You know. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Most stuff I figure out is on accident anyway. <laughs> Accidental like, genius. That's, it comes natural, man. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not rocket science. But, I mean, it's, you just gotta you gotta want to do it, and because it, it, it takes a lot. I mean, you you really have to want to do it to to subject yourself to the the judgment and the criticism and and all that kind of thing. But like I said, ultimately you determine who and who get, it's who hears it and when. So yeah, you have the control of that. Yeah, so. cool. Which is good. We were talking uh, earlier before we started filming. We were talking a little bit about record companies and, and your own music and kind of maintaining the control of, of of your stuff. You know, you you know, if you ever sign to a label, which you know we all know is labels are kind of dying out. You know, but you know, as an independent artist, do you think it's important to maintain control of your your stuff? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys making a whole lot of money in in just the state of Texas, just playing their own stuff and selling their own CDs and selling their own merch. There's so many ways to go about it, like on the internet and stuff now. There's mm -hmm. so, it, it's so much more accessible than it was 10 years ago, you know? And that's kind of what, why the labels are going away. It's because you don't need the, the big backing to put out quality product anymore. Yeah, stick it to the man. Yeah, stick it to the man. Awesome. All right, cool. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. Uh, you remember my notes. All right, well, think of, speaking of sticking it to the man, um, do you have some CDs available or stuff come out? Or if someone wants to check out Jimmy Bay's music and they don't live in East Texas, I mean, how can they get access to what you're doing? You got uh, My stuff, I got, I've got a CD on iTunes. Plus, there's a single of a song that Matt, Matt Fisher and I wrote called Trouble that we recorded in a studio out in Tool um, that you can get on iTunes, uh, just the web page. You can mm -hmm. get it all there. You can get the physical CD there. You can get you can do the digital downloads, caps and shirts and koozies and all that koozies. Fun stuff. Yeah. Sure. What's the uh, what's the website? Uh, JimmyBaileyMusic.com JimmyBaileyMusic.com Go there right now and check it out. <laughs> okay. And you're on Facebook too? Oh yeah. Along with everybody else? Yeah, everybody else. Has that been, uh, have, have, have how has that worked? Has that been beneficial for you? Have you? Yeah, I mean, it gets it, it it gets more and more useful every day. I mean, really, now that the businesses are actually starting to get involved in it, and it's mm -hmm. not just your group of buddies, you know, anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, people can follow a venue on Facebook and find out who's playing there just as easy as going to their web page. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's just another access point. Cool. All right, well, um, that's a lot of the questions I had. We, we've taken a little bit of time here, and we could probably talk for forever. But um, what's uh, what's the rest of 2011 got for Jimmy Bailey and the Aristocrats? Um, I'm trying to book a lot of gigs. Um, we're working on, Paul and I are working on a CD. I'm hoping to go in and do another CD uh, towards the end of the summer. Mm -hmm. um, probably back over in Tool. Um, right now, I'm st still writing. Uh, constantly writing, but I think we've pretty much got material for the new CD. Um, we just got to finish up recording and stuff. It's a, it's such a longer process than people think it is. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, it's coming along. Hopefully, we'll have some more, at least some more singles out before the end of the year. Though I can't say when. Cool. So, possibly record another CD before the year's done. Play lots of gigs. Mm -hmm. um, now, if somebody wants to book you for a gig, how can they get a hold of you for that? Uh, either the web page or. Uh, or the Facebook or, you know, anything. Okay. My, my phone number's on my Facebook. You can call me directly. <laughs> it's on there. We might even put it on this video. Yeah, yeah. Like a ride around here somewhere. If you want to book Jimmy Bailey and the Aristocrats, call this number. <laughs> or this number. Something like that. Yeah. Great. Well, cool. Well, before we get done, uh, we want, I'd like to uh, 
have you guys play a song. I'm going to step out of the, the scene here and um, you guys can do a song. And uh, Aristocrat today, but uh, y'all have a gig tonight. Yeah, mm -hmm. walks ahead you tonight. Is this a full band, full a meal full deal? Band. Mm -hmm. Sweet. All right. So what? What? Are some upcoming gigs the next month or two? Um, we got walks ahead you tonight. Uh, we got a big show in uh, at Lakeview Lodge in Athens next month with uh, Dead End Alley from Corsicana, friend of mine, David Harness's band. They're awesome. So if you want to come see a good show, come cool. out to that one. You have details. You have on your website. You've got um. Yeah, it's all on the website. Jimmy so. Bailey Music dot com. com. You got your itinerary and all that stuff. Yeah. So. yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, we'll check that out. I appreciate you guys coming today, and um, look forward to all the new music. Thanks, Ryan. Peace out, you guys. <laughs>